I'm Jane Vossler, and I want to welcome you on behalf of the Community Senior Center. We're really pleased to have Lee Simmerts with us today. He's a fisheries biologist at the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, and he's going to talk to us, you know, about talk to us about salmon. So, Lee, I'll turn it over to you. And if you want to say anything more about your background, please feel free to. Great. Um, yeah. I'll, let me let me. Uh... Start sharing my screen, make sure that works first. <laughs> Great, that seems to be working. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, well, thank you everyone uh, for, for joining today. Um, my name is Lee Samard, and uh, as, as Jane said, I'm a fisheries biologist with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. Um, in Vermont, uh, the, the fisheries division within uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife is split up into to five districts. So we're, uh, each, each district has about two biologists um, spread throughout the state. And, and within each uh, district, we're responsible for managing um, the fisheries resources within, within that district. So uh, my district covers uh, northern, uh, the northwest corner of the state, northern Lake Champlain. Um, but much of my work uh, actually spreads onto the the inland uh, water portions of the state. So the Missisquoi River watershed, the Lamoille up until about Morrisville, and then the Winooski River, which uh, we're talking about today, up to about Bolton Dam. Um, and I'll, I'll provide the caveat and apologize uh, ahead of time. Um, when you have a two-year-old daughter in daycare, uh, they're real good at sharing colds. Uh, they learn how to share real well. So. Uh, apologize in advance if I cough or have to uh, pop a cough drop in. Um, but yeah, today I'll be talking about um, <clears throat> management of landlocked Atlantic salmon in the Winooski River um, and provide a sort of a high level overview about what that management looks like um, and then certainly open up to any questions uh, about that overview or if, if, if you have more specifics you want to dig into, happy to, happy to do that as well. Um, so uh, landlocked Atlantic salmon uh, are uh, native species to Lake Champlain. Um, if you, many of you have probably heard of Atlantic salmon, um, landlocked Atlantic salmon are the same thing, except they don't have uh, uh, the ability or they don't uh, go back to the ocean. Um, they remain a freshwater species. So in this case, um, uh, the landlocked Atlantic salmon, uh, Lake Champlain is sort of their ocean, uh, and they just stay within freshwater for their entire life. Um, again, they're a native species to Lake Champlain uh, in the basin, um, but they were last recorded in 1834, actually, uh, in, in Lake Champlain. Um, what caused them to disappear at that time? Um, a variety of factors, but as, as many of you probably are aware, a lot of uh, the changes were due to, to land use changes in this period. Uh, much of Vermont, uh, especially the, the watersheds along our large rivers and valleys were uh, harvested and deforested. Um, not only does that have like direct impacts to the river during, during these log drives, um, but you also then have resulting uh, sediment concerns as now the barren hills and landscape around um, has a lot of sedimentation that comes in and can cover in, uh, rocks and gravels and, and change the river dynamics. Uh, the other thing that really changed the, the landscape were dams. Um, here's a picture of uh, the Swanton Dam uh, in Swanton, Vermont on the Missisquoi River. And these dams created impassable barriers to, to fish that would otherwise be moving upstream uh, to spawn. Um, and, and most rivers, especially on the Vermont side, uh, have, have dams on them uh, preventing that, that movement. Um, <clears throat> that was uh, sort of some brief historic context, uh, but to move us a little more into to the current day, um, in 1972, uh, the Lake Champlain Fisheries Technical Committee, or the FTC, was created. Um, in this group, it was a, a commitment by both uh, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, uh, the New York Department of Environmental Conservation, or, or the New York DEC, as well as our federal partners, the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, all these groups came together uh, acknowledging that 
to to restore some of these uh, species we lost in Lake Champlain, such as landlocked Atlantic salmon, uh, would take a, a combined group effort. Um, so in 1972, the FTC was formed, uh, again, with a focus on restoring uh, Atlantic salmon to the lake. Um, but the FTC also works collectively on other species, such as uh, lake trout management and recovery in Lake Champlain um, and sea lamprey control work to, to benefit uh, salmon and lake trout. One of the, the primary purpose uh, of restoring lake trout and, and salmon, again, what we're focusing on, was to create that in-lake fishery. Um, and by and large, the, the FTC has been very successful at, at that. Um, and this was done in large part through, through stocking efforts throughout the basin. The FTC uh, is really driven uh, by a, a strategic plan that goes over the how to proceed with restoration of uh, Lake Champlain fisheries. Uh, this current draft was last created in uh, 2020, was updated in 2020. But what I'll also say is there's some other sub plans, uh, specifically looking at uh, Atlantic salmon. Um, we've created recently a river run restoration plan. Um, I'll say we've been working on restoration of uh, landlocked Atlantic salmon to rivers for, for many decades uh, around the basin, um, but this plan was uh, officially formalized recently in, in 2022. Um, specifically, this plan focuses on seven different rivers uh, around Lake Champlain, both in New York and uh, Vermont, that historically had landlocked Atlantic salmon runs, um, but are ones that are now uh, potentially feasible for us to, to continue to focus on. Um, and again, today we'll be looking specifically at what that looks like for the Winooski River. <clears throat> so I keep talking about uh, salmon and salmon runs coming back to the river. Uh, what does that mean and why is that happening? Um, if people are familiar most often with uh, Pacific salmon, the big, uh, the big salmon that you hear about living their lives out in the ocean, and then they come up and uh, swim hundreds of miles potentially up these tributaries to spawn and, and die um, in those tributaries. Landlocked Atlantic salmon uh, and Atlantic salmon in general go through a, a similar process. Uh, I'll say they don't necessarily always die, but do, um, do sometimes die after they swim up to spawn. But that's really, again, what we're focusing on is these adult salmon that are living their lives out in Lake Champlain, but then moving into these tributaries uh, in an effort to spawn uh, within those tributaries. Again, the, the rivers we're talking about, including the Winooski River, uh, were all uh, rivers that historically had those uh, natural salmon runs and there was successful natural reproduction. Um, so again, specifically, we're looking at the Winooski River. Um, when those historic salmon runs came moving up the river, um, they would swim up the Winooski and in uh, where we currently have uh, the Winooski One Dam. Um, and that was probably the, the uh, first natural barrier uh, on the Winooski River that those salmon encountered. Uh, it's possible that they got past that dam uh, or where the dam currently is. Uh, there's a fall lines that they may have gotten past. Um, but just upstream, there's another dam, Gorge 18, uh, that uh, you can see if you're you're traveling Interstate 89 across the Winooski River. That was probably, um, if not down below, uh, the historic extent of where these adult salmon could move up to. Um, as I mentioned, though, we've we built a lot of dams on the Winooski River. So we also have the Essex 19 Dam in, in Essex Junction. This is along uh, just by the, the IBM or the, the now Global Foundries Access Road. You can see that dam right there as you're driving along Route 2. Um, and then we have many more dams further upstream. Uh, in your neck of the woods is, is the Bolton Falls Dam, uh, sort of the up, upstream extent that we'll be talking about today. Um, but, but moving back downstream to the first dam, uh, the Winooski one, this is, uh, this is a shot from, uh, Google, uh, Google maps, um, looking at, uh, you can see here Colchester Avenue or, or route two, uh, as it crosses from Burlington into the Winooski circle. Um, 
I'm not sure if my mouse is actually visible or not um, on the screen, right? Um, but this is the location of the Winooski One Dam. So just downstream is this big area is called the Salmon Hole. Um, Burlington has a park that you can walk down and, and visit this area, a big hole. But then this is a natural falls line uh, where uh, a hydroelectric facility, Burlington, uh, or owned by Burlington Electric, uh, built the Winooski One Dam. Um, uh, there, there's many areas around the dam that you can walk around. This is uh, one view of it. As you can see, there's uh, a couple different spillways uh, on the, the dam, and, and you can see the, the bridge going from Burlington into Winooski and sort of the downtown circle in the background. So salmon, uh, historically, let's assume that that dam was the natural fall line for Atlantic salmon. And we're saying salmon were coming back uh, back to the river to spawn. They probably did much of their spawning in the areas further downstream of, of that fall line. Um, presently, though, we don't see that uh, very much. If um, We see a, maybe a little bit of spawning activity. But by and large, this lower portion of the river, um, this is uh, partway downstream along the Ethan Allen Homestead area. Uh, again, a Google satellite image. Um, you can see it's turned into a lot of agricultural land, um, but is now a, a slow meandering uh, deep river uh, with a lot of heavy sedimentation in the bottoms. Probably uh, a legacy of those early deforestation practices in Vermont that caused a lot of erosion and sedimentation to come come downstream into the river and cover up those areas, the, the gravel and rocky areas that salmon and other species spawned on. Um, also, uh, this area of the river gets very warm now. Uh, it's these large open agricultural areas um, and water temperature is also impacted by everything that happens further upstream, uh, such that basically None of this area downstream of Winooski One is now suitable for uh, landlocked Atlantic salmon to, to successfully spawn. And if they did successfully spawn, um, they, their young pro certainly wouldn't, wouldn't survive. So in response to that, um, in 1993, um, Burlington Electric uh, was going through its FERC relicensing process for the uh, Winooski One Dam. Um, FERC is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So anytime a, a new, uh, uh, like in this case, a hydroelectric facility uh, needs to get a new operating license every 30 to 50 years. Uh, and when that happens, it has to go through a, a, a five plus year process to, to do studies to identify uh, ways that it, it needs to address impacts of its operations. And as part of that, um, FERC required that um, the Winooski One Dam or in Burlington Electric build a fish lift at that facility. Um, so if you look at the, the, the dam, you can see there's kind of two channels. Um, if you're looking upstream here, on the right hand side are where those two bladders were, where uh, the river spills a, across the dam. But then on the, the left side, looking upstream, is this other area. And that's the, actually the powerhouse uh, where all the generation and turbines are for, for the hydroelectric facility. But <clears throat> this is a, a, a picture of that. So again, within, the, within this building uh, and actually down below are actually the, the giant uh, turbines that are, are powered uh, by the river. But then uh, what I want to focus you on is, is this area right here pointed uh, by the arrows is actually where that fish lift um, uh, was built. So what this fish lift is, is, is a big steel hopper, basically. I'll show you in the next picture. Um, but water, if you can kind of see um, there's some water movement that comes out of those areas that generates an attractant flow. So salmon are uh, see and feel that flow coming down and, and want to move towards that and move into that uh, back cavern um, and then are basically in the river above this hopper. Um, staff at Burlington Electric then periodically uh, be, uh, lifts this hopper, 
specifically um, operating windows for it are between September 15th and November 15th every year. Um, this is the, the time when salmon uh, naturally are, are interested in spawning and, and come up the rivers. Um, so during that period, staff will lift that hopper th at least three times a day. Um, and you can kind of see right in the background are uh, a few salmon that are actually caught in that lift um, that we then capture and, and process. Um, so once you once we process those fish, you can see this big water tank here. This, this is actually a holding tank that we can put covers over. So um, uh, if a, a fish is caught on a Saturday morning, the, the operators can put it in that holding tank. And on Monday, uh, myself and my staff will show up and, and uh, what we, we say is work up the fish. Um, basically, that means we collect a variety of uh, biological information about that fish. So you can see our, our board here set up with a, a variety of instruments. Uh, my technician with a data sheet gain water temperature. Um, we have a length board on there. Um, and scan it for different tags, potentially uh, take genetic samples. Um, Here's a picture. Um, <clears throat> again, this is all done in partnership with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, this is Nick Stats. Uh, some of you might know him from his uh, work in the in the watershed over the past 30 years before he retired a couple of years ago. Um, here he is handling a, a salmon, uh, checking it for various marks, and then we'll get a, a length uh, and weight on that fish. Um, and then again, here's just a few other pictures of, of some of the fish that uh, we handle. Um, <clears throat> so once once we're done collecting that information, or, or one, one more thing I'll, I'll note, uh, in a few of these pictures, you can see this yellow tag. Uh, we put one of those tags in each of the salmon we handle, and it has a, a unique number on it so that if we ever capture that fish again, or, or if an angler catches that fish again, they can report that tag number and, and we know exactly when and where uh, we collected it and the information of that fish when, when we collected it. So once we're, we're finished collecting that biological information, uh, we put that fish in, in this tank in the back of a truck. We fill that with water. Um, we send oxygen into that tank. And then uh, uh, John Clark, who's on the left side of this picture, uh, the operator at, at the Winooski One Dam will will drive that truck to move that fish upstream of the dam. So as I said earlier, there, there's many dams on the river. Uh, we're operating right here at the Winooski One facility, but just upstream of that is Gorge 18 and, and Essex 19. So if we were to just simply put that fish on the, the upstream side of the dam, it wouldn't be able to uh, go very far. Um, so instead what's required is that that fish gets put in the back of the truck uh, and driven all the way upstream to Richmond, uh, where we release those salmon uh, back into the Winooski River, uh, a little ways downstream of Hun the Huntington River um, at the, the uh, uh, canoe launch access point uh, along the road there. Um, so uh, why do we move the fish all the way up there? Um, one reason is, as, as I talked about earlier, uh, the spawning opportunities downstream of the Winooski One Dam just aren't, aren't there. The water conditions and, and the habitat conditions aren't suitable for spawning. Although this stretch of the river is not so, the, the historic natural range of, of salmon, it does have many of the habitat characteristics where spawning could successfully occur. So here's again another snapshot of a, a section of the, uh, the river and you can see all these gravel bars that have different depths at different times of the year uh, and, and flow configurations that those are areas that could be suitable for, um, uh, for salmon to successfully spawn. I'll say while it's possible and, and we do see some uh, reds or, or fish nests basically being created in these gravels um, and we have uh, on some instances seen uh, evidence of natural successful reproduction, um, by and large, it, it's not very successful. Um, so while there is the opportunity for uh, some natural reproduction, it's not something that we're 
we're really banking on as, as enough to create uh, and sustain a natural population. So one of the primary things we're doing is uh, to create angling opportunities. Um, normally salmon spend most of their life uh, uh, out in Lake Champlain, which is, is great, but uh, you need a boat. Uh, to be able to really su successfully fish for them, you need to uh, have a boat where you can travel around the lake and, and, and troll for them. Um, I don't have a boat. Uh, so what we want to do is create opportunities elsewhere where someone fishing from shore that doesn't have that resource has the potential to, to catch one of these beautiful fish. Um, and that's the other benefit of this stretch of the river is there are many areas uh, where anglers can access the Winooski River uh, uh, and access where these salmon are released and, and stay um, in, in the hopes of uh, being able to catch one of them. <clears throat> so uh, again, if I say if, if there is no re natural reproduction, if there isn't any reproduction uh, in the Winooski River um, that would sustain this population, how do we get these adult salmon uh, returning to the Winooski? Where are they coming from uh, to begin with? Um, if we go back to that strategic plan uh, that the FTC uh, has, uh, the whole management organization for salmon, uh, part of the plan says uh, the the objective is to maintain a healthy Atlantic salmon population in Lake Champlain and its tributaries that supports a quality recreational fishery. Um, so what I, I mentioned is we're trying to restore recreational fishing opportunities in, in the river, um, but overall, by and large, most of the recreational opportunities are within the lake. So um, as I said from the get-go, most of this salmon work is uh, being supported through stocking. Um, since most of the, the uh, fishing happens in the lake, uh, a large portion of the stocking we do happens directly in the lake as well. Um, we have access locations throughout throughout the lake shore that that we stock fish, um, but some some of them actually they go for a ferry ride and partway throughout across the lake uh, the tanks are opened up and and the fish are released directly into the lake. Um, however, uh, those fish don't necessarily contribute to the river fishery. Uh, so if we want to step back to this life cycle, how do we get those salmon to actually come back to, say, the Winooski River specifically? Um, <clears throat> if we look at these younger life stages, so uh, if if I walk through the, this cycle, adults, uh, salmon come in, they spawn, lay eggs, those eggs develop into eyed eggs. Uh, when they hatch, they have these little yolk sacs of nutrient uh, which su support them. Uh, and once they use that up, uh, they become fry. So little small fish. Uh, those fry will grow over uh, uh, the, the rest of that summer. So they'll, they'll hatch uh, in the spring. Um, they'll live through that summer and the summer afterwards uh, as par within the river. And then the following spring is when uh, they transform into this small life stage and out migrate into the river or out migrate through the river back to the lake. Um, so if all of these life stages are occurring within the river itself, those are all our options that we could use to uh, stock within the river in hopes of getting adult fish back to the river at a later point. Um, so why does stocking into the river actually uh, help? Um, salmon have this uh, uh, process, as do many fish, that when they're uh, growing up within the river, um, they smell uh, very distinct uh, amino acids or characteristics of that water body that they imprint on. Um, so then later in their life, when they have that instinct to spawn and return, uh, they have that area where they imprinted, where they knew they were successful at, at uh, growing up themselves, uh, and they'll return to that location following that sense of smell. Um, if we uh, then look at, okay, we have those life stages that we could stock. Um, we've tried most of them. Um, if we look at fry specifically, some of you uh, in the area might have uh, heard about in the past uh, salmon fry stocking that occurred throughout the Huntington River. 
Um, the benefit of fry is that uh, they haven't lived very long. They they aren't in the hatchery for very long. So they spent instead spend most of their, their lives, in this case, in the Huntington River, where they're exposed to those smells uh, within the river and are able to imprint theoretically or imprint well. Um, and then at, at a later point, return back as, as adults. The challenge, uh, though, is these fish are very, very small. So although we may put in tens of thousands of them, very few of them survive. Um, one of the challenges is we would stock them out in the spring, uh, and you could have a, a large spring uh, rain event a couple days later that would bring flows up and, and wash all those fry away, and, and they would never show up again. Um, so what we, we've uh, experimented with some more uh, was stocking par, that, that next life stage up. Um, again, the, at that point, uh, survival is a little bit higher. They still encounter many of those uh, periods where they can imprint on, on the river. Um, but again, it's still multiple years that they have to remain within the river, survive within the river uh, before out migrating to the lake. So the, the final option is uh, stocking smolts. So um, even when we're stocking the fry in, in the par, uh, we have generally always stocked salmon smolts uh, into the Winooski River. Um, these fishes, you can, if you look at sort of the coloration between the par, you can see they go from having uh, a little more colorful marks uh, in, in these bands on, on the sides of them that help them uh, blend into their surroundings in the river and then smolt turn this silver color um actually change physiologically uh and then have the instinct to out migrate to to the lake um that coloration and in, in that physiology helps them be better adapted to survival in lake champlain uh, but because they have that out migrating instinct uh they aren't spending much time in the river thus they uh they have a better chance of surviving but they do, it comes at the cost of not having that full time within the river to imprint uh, and hopefully return uh, to the river. Um, so that, that's the strategy we're, we're employing now. We have multiple experiments about how to stock uh, those smolts at, in different locations or in, in different ways to in, still increase that imprinting as much as possible in hopes that they come back as adults uh, to the Winooski One fish lift. Um, and what I'll put up here is, uh, to, to close us out, is a figure showing the, the, the number of salmon that we've caught each fall at the Winooski One fish lift um, since the, the lift was put into operation in 1993. Um, and what you can see is uh, things fluctuate a lot. Uh, the, the biggest takeaway I'll say is uh, we're still trying to figure out uh, how, how to best uh, operate this system. Um, we're not only trying to take into account stocking and, and uh, conditions within the river, um, but we also have to recognize that these uh, smolts that we stock are going out into Lake Champlain where they, they stay for a year and a half to two and a half years. There are a lot of unknowns uh, within that lake that could contribute to uh, how many fish return. Um, 2022 was certainly a, a, a high note after several years of Pretty, pretty poor returns. Um, we had our, our fourth highest return rate in 2022 with 128 salmon. Um, again, we're changing a few things up. Uh, we have uh, pretty good sea lamprey control efforts going uh, in Lake Champlain, which are sea lamprey are a parasitic fish species that, that can prey on salmon and lake trout and other fish um, and, and decrease in lake survival. So we're hoping as we put all of these things together into a, a more comprehensive management uh, strategy uh, that these uh, numbers can continue to increase in the future. Um, and with that, I will uh, stop and take any questions. I have a question. Hi, Lee. Hi. Can you talk about downstream passage? It sounds like they got three big obstacles to go over to get back to the lake. What's that like? That, that's a great question. Yeah, I, I thought about whether to put that in, but I, I'm, so I'm, I didn't and I'm glad someone asked. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. So as I mentioned, um, uh, salmon come upstream during their spawning period in the fall. So uh, September through November, but really October, November period is when we get the bulk of the run. Um, and then we move them upstream. They spawn uh, sometime in early November. Um, and then a few option things can happen. Either some of them will die. Some just it's a, a lot of energy to migrate and spawn and go through that effort. So some some will just naturally die. Some of them will then immediately uh, go back to the lake. Uh, and we've done some uh, tagging and tracking studies uh, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that has shown that they'll go back out to the lake in November. Um, others will actually stay in the river in the Richmond uh, Bolton area uh, and uh, leave the following spring. Um, but uh, as you say, when they do decide to go back downstream, they, they have those three dams. Um, uh, and when they go past those dams, uh, they have three options. Um, one, they can spill over the top. So if, if you see any of these dams, when, when flows are high enough or under certain conditions, they, they'll actually spill water over the top of the dam. Uh, they could go through the powerhouse. So water is sent through the, the generating turbines. Um, you can imagine that that could be a challenging route for fish. Um, or each of these dams do have uh, a downstream fish bypass. So the idea is there's some sort of attractant to uh, a flow or to an area uh, that is basically a tube of some sort um, that allows the fish to bypass spilling or bypass the power generation uh, and hopefully get downstream safer than the other two options. Um, all of these are things we evaluate during that FERC hydro relicensing period, which uh, coincidentally, we're in the middle of doing for Essex 19 and the Winooski one licenses uh, that five year renewal. It takes about five years to go through the renewal process that begins uh, next year, I believe, if not this year. Um, one thing we're seeing at Essex 19 is uh, survival spilling is okay for adults um but the survival of uh uh the downstream fish bypass which you would think is the best way is is actually not very good uh there's just inherent design problems with with that bypass so it's something that we look into and, and try to improve upon uh during that relicensing period So do all the dams have a bypass on them, on the Winooski or not? Uh, I believe so. So while well, those three do, um, depending on moving upstream, I'm, I'm not as sure. It, it gets outside of my management district, so I don't know as much. Right, oh, but just the three you talked about. Correct. They do have some form of downstream bypass. But not upstream. Correct. So the only one with any form of upstream is uh the is winooski one with that fish lift um which then it's is part of the the trap and truck uh program is what we call it where salmon are moved upstream um given it said uh especially winooski one and and gorge uh 18 are at a natural fall line we sort of look at the question of would would fish be moving upstream anyway uh, in these locations? Um, but it's also uh, from a, a management perspective, is there a need for fish to move upstream? Um, even though there there might be some benefit uh, for resident species to be moving up and down around a dam, um, upstream uh, fish passage is uh, not cheap and not always very effective. Um, so it, it, it really needs a, a, a pretty strong justification to, to put it in place. Um, and then it, it needs to be valued and make sure it's put in place well. Nicole, you have a question. Yes. Um, you said, Lee, hi, Lee. Hi. Um, you said that you stock with smelt as well as par. Yeah, so, so 
So is your success rate with the um, smolt higher than with the par? Yeah. So actually, at this point, all we're stocking are smolts. Uh, so I, I showed we had been stocking with fry and we had been stocking with par or uh, we would call them fall fingerlings sometimes. Um, and our return rights were very poor. Um, so it, the the last time we actually stocked the fingerlings, uh, the, the par was, I believe, in 2019 uh, was the last season. And, and we're now only stocking smolts. Um, part of the reason is uh, those smolts. Uh, if we stock them as par finger lane that far upstream, they have to pass all three dams as well. There's mortality associated with that. Um, and the, the benefit of imprinting, uh, the increased imprinting isn't, hasn't been shown to be enough to offset, uh, that mortality. Um, and again, it comes also back to, uh, one of our first objectives as the collective FTC is uh, managing that in-lake fishery. Um, so the in-lake fishery is the priority. Um, and so we want to make sure enough salmon make it into the lake to provide that fishery. Um, and what we're trying to do is provide that in-lake fishery while also then getting fish to return to the rivers in the fall. Um, so we don't want, even if we did get some better return rates, um, we don't want to do it in such a way where there are enough fish within the lake as well. Do you have more success in the other rivers that you work <laughs> with than with Winooski or is, is the experience about the same? Yeah. So, um, the, uh, on the Vermont side, our, our four, our four salmon rivers are the, the Winooski Lamoille, Missiscoy and Otter Creek. Um, the Missiscoy and the Otter Creek, we stock smolts similarly. It, well, the Lamoille, we stock smolts similarly in, in lower stretches of the river. And we get pretty minor returns uh, to to the, the, the Missiscoy and Otter Creek. Um, they provide a little bit of a fishery, but, but not too much. Um, the Lamoille, for some generally unknown reason, uh, does get substantially more returning fish each fall. Um, the Lamoille is actually a, a very popular spot for salmon anglers in the fall to, to catch um, salmon as they come back to spawn. Um, there are dams on each of those uh, rivers as well, but none of them have um, any upstream trap and truck, excuse me, trap and truck or any upstream passage. Um, uh, on Otter Creek, the first fall is at the Virgin. The first dam is at the Virgin's Falls, which was the natural fall line there. So there's not really a, a need to move fish uh, upstream there. Um, the Lamoille, the, the Peterson Dam is the first dam. Um, they could historically make it up a little further. Um, and, and the Peterson Dam is, is one that we uh, we have on our radar for other reasons, and including Lake Sturgeon is, is a big one. Um, but on the Missisquoi, that that's an opportunity for a future improvement. Is uh, the the first dam is the Swanton Dam, which is right in in Swanton Village. If any of you have, have been up there, uh, and that that's a relatively low head dam that doesn't provide any. Uh, current use or current value to the village. It, it's a sort of historic and aesthetic uh, reason. I, I grew up in Swanton and, and so I feel I can speak with some authority on it, but that removal of the Swanton Dam is probably the, the single most, uh, probably the highest priority for uh, restoration for fisheries in Vermont because um, it would allow uh, access for spawning, not as much for salmon, the river is still pretty warm, but it would open up habitat for uh, other species such as lake sturgeon or walleye, other nat native species to uh, to successfully spawn and, and reproduce. Any other questions?
Thank you very much, Lee. It was very interesting and informative and great pictures. Oh, thank you. No, I, I appreciate everyone attending and, and the great questions. It's, uh, I'm glad to be able to connect with uh, a, a different part of the community than I normally talk to. Although I talked to Nicole uh, a, a little bit, so. <laughs> great job, very interesting. Thank you. You're, Thank you're you, welcome. Lee. Yeah. Thank you, Jane, for hosting. You're welcome. Yeah. Well, have a great afternoon, everyone. Yeah, it's a great one. Nice yeah. and warm. <laughs> Snowshoeing. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Bye.